excuse my water up here, by the way. I, it never ceases to fail. Whenever I go to do some major speaking engagement, I come down with some sort of bug. That's not ever a coincidence in our book. You know, it's absolutely my pleasure to be here today. And I want to thank National Right to Life for having me and, and certainly for all of you for attending. I know 7.30 on a Friday morning isn't always the most exciting thought in someone's head when they're at a conference, but it is an important time for us to be together, whether it's 7.30 in the morning or 7.30 at night. And I just appreciate each and every one of you, not only for being here, but for doing what you do each and every day. And as you've seen on the signs and in the marketing materials for today, I'm going to talk today about the apathy that exists in our nation and how it really fuels and drives so much of what we see happening in our communities and in our state houses and in our capital. But before I start talking about that today and sharing some of my own story, I want to put it into the context of what happened in my life. As we're talking today about prayerfully reflecting on abortion, and how it has impacted so many lives and so many communities, so many families. I want to tell you all that I know that prayer saved my life. And I want to share a story with you about how I learned that. A couple of years ago, I was speaking at an event about an hour south of where I live in western Iowa. Other Iowans in the house? I know there's a few. All right, excellent. I'm sitting with the folks from Idaho, so I have to be sure to talk about our Iowa friends. But I was speaking at an event about an hour south of where I live in Iowa. And as I was sitting there speaking that night, there were two particular men who got my attention. Both of them were sobbing. And both of them were very, very emotional about what I was speaking of that night. And I was really speaking about my father's own experience in that abortion that was meant to end my life. And so that's not uncommon for me to see men so taken by that. But that night, these two men were so emotional about it. The young man on my right left before I ever had a chance to ask him that night what it was that had touched him so deeply. The second man, however, went to step on the stage that night to give the closing prayer. And as he stepped up onto the stage, I saw the collar of his shirt peek out. He was a local priest. I didn't know him at the time. But he stepped up on the stage that night, and everyone must have felt in the room like he was speaking to them. But I felt in particular like he was speaking to me. And he was pointing at me. And he said, and who says that prayers go unanswered? And it, it took my breath away. I thought, oh my gosh, I, I, I don't know where this is going. And he said, in 1977, I used to pray outside St. Luke's Hospital in Sioux City, Iowa, that a child's life would be spared from abortion. And here I am tonight, standing face to face with a woman whose life was spared from abortion at that hospital. Can I get it? Absolutely unbelievable. And now since that time, I've spoken at many events in Iowa, and I have been so blessed to meet people who used to walk outside that hospital and pray outside that hospital that a child's life like mine would be spared. So I'm here today to say half faith, absolutely half faith, you may not ever know how many lives you touch, how many lives you save, but you have to have faith that there are more children like me that exist in this world because of your prayers. And I'm getting a note from the computer that it's doing something. We will not even worry about that right now. <laughs> Technical difficulties, that's okay. You know, as I as I've started to share with you and as you've heard already, you know, it's a saline infusion abortion that was meant to end my life. But sadly, what I live with now in our world and what we all live with every day is that it's the apathy that's killing me. It's the apathy that is taking the lives of children like me each and every day. Isn't that an interesting thing it continues to do? <laughs> Excellent. We'll just all pretend, including myself, that it's not happening. <laughs> and certainly we know that it's that apathy that exists sometimes in our own families, sometimes in our congregations, in our parishes, in our state houses, in our capital. We know that it's that apathy that continues to fuel public perception about abortion, about the sanctity of human life, 
and therefore drives things like legislation and education that we are trying to do in our communities. And certainly it's that apathy that stops many of those things that we want to accomplish from happening. And we know that today, almost 4,000 children just like me are going to lose their lives to abortion. And I know that all of us are here today because we understand the horrors of that. Yet we are passionate to the plight of the unborn. We are compassionate to the needs of women and men who find themselves in the circumstances to be driven to abortion. No matter what mainstream media wants to say, we are compassionate to the needs of women and men. But sadly, we know that that apathy still exists and we need to battle that apathy that is ending human lives each and every day. I think the hardest part for me in all of the work that I do as an abortion survivor is not people who outright disagree with me. I can educate people. I can help people to understand about my life. What hurts me so badly is when people say things like, it's none of my business what a woman does with her body. I would never have an abortion, but it's, it's not something I concern myself with for someone else, right? We all hear those things every day, and that is the apathy that we need to continue to fight, to make a change, to take back our nation, and make a difference in the lives of children like me each and every day. And my story starts in August of 1977, you know, I always joke, I'm not too prideful to say that I'm almost 34 years old. <laughs> Yet. Give me about six more years and I might not bring up that date anymore. You all can just watch and wait. I had some young men at a youth group in Georgia a couple of months ago when I was speaking. They started to do the math and they ran the numbers and said, you're 304 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and that wasn't even at 7.30 in the morning. So... Either I was having a rough day or I look great for being 304, I'm not sure which. But it was in August of 1977 that my biological mother entered St. Luke's Hospital in Sioux City, Iowa to undergo that saline infusion abortion. And my mother fits most statistics when it comes to abortion. She was an unmarried college student, and it was not her decision to end my life. What I've learned over time is that it was one of her very well-intentioned parents my own grandparents, who made that decision. And I know when people come face to face with me, whether they are pro-life or even pro-choice, I know that that shocks people. To be looking face to face at the child who someone else made the decision that their life should end. But we all know that my experience is not unique. We know that very well-intentioned friends and family members in our world still believe that abortion is the best option for so many women including college-aged women. And so I don't, I don't look down upon my grandparents for making that decision. I have no doubt they thought they were doing the right thing like so many other people. And when my biological mother entered that hospital, the saline infusion abortion started and it took place over five days. I was bathed in that toxic salt solution that was discussed earlier over that five-day period. I should have been scalded to death while I was still in my mother's womb. The baby literally convulses in the body of the mother before it is delivered dead. And on the fifth day of the procedure, my biological mother thought she was going to give birth to her dead child. Certainly the medical professionals believed so also. And when she went to the hospital on that fifth day, I was delivered in bed and I was left for dead. Understandably so. And from what I've been told, as the nurse was tending to my biological mother, she looked over and realized that I was making small movements with my body and gasping for breath. And that's when the medical professionals realized that I had been aborted. I had been aborted, but I was born alive. A. <laughs> I've been really blessed over my life to know many of the medical pro professionals who cared for me. I have a long-standing relationship with one nurse in particular. And certainly we know there is no medical reason why I survived. <laughs> I don't need a medical reason. I have something way better than that. And I'm thankful for that. 
I'm thankful for that. But certainly some people struggle with that. When they see me, it's hard to believe that I was the child who was aborted, but lived. I hear all of the time, typically in mainstream media, people say things like, she can't be the child who was aborted. She must be a woman who had an abortion. I understand that. I understand that. Because you wouldn't know it by looking at me today, but at the time I weighed two pounds, 14 ounces. I literally fit in the palm of people's hand. I slept in a shoebox. I suffered from severe respiratory problems. I had severe liver problems. I suffered from seizures for an extended period of time. Because of that toxic salt solution and what it was starting to do to me, I lost a lot of blood. And so I required multiple blood transfusions. And if you ever see pictures of me, and if you come to the viewing of A Voice for Life tonight at 6.30 p.m., I gotta get that plug in. If you come tonight, you'll get to see some pictures of me when I was an infant and I was in the incubator. And what you'll see is that I was shaved on my head from temple to temple because I was too weak to suck from a bottle. And so I was fed intravenously through a line in my head for an extended period of time. And I know when people hear those things, looking at me, you just couldn't guess it. But the hardest part, I think, for so many people in our world, especially those who are apathetic to abortion, is that if you look at me and realize that I was one of those children who were supposed to leave, lose their life from abortion, then people have to admit that those 53 million other children, just like me, who have lost their lives, could have been standing here this morning. And should be standing here. And truly, that's been part of my own personal battle. You know, sometimes when people meet me here, they say, hey, I think you've been here before. I know I've seen you. I'll admit to you, this is my first National Right to Life Convention. And I thought, why not start small? <laughs> why not? Build up from here. But what had to happen in my life were numerous things. Numerous things. And first of all, the most important thing was that I needed to find out the truth about my life. And that didn't happen until I was 14 years old. Now, I went home to an adoptive family within just two months two months of surviving that failed abortion attempt. 34 years ago, that's a huge deal for a child like me to live and then to go home in a short period of time. But I know that that was the love of my family. It was the love of the doctors and nurses who treated me and their belief in me. You know, it blows me away to talk to those doctors and nurses and hear them say, you know what, Melissa? Even though those doctors said you wouldn't live for very long, and if you did live, you would be disabled, I didn't believe it. We knew. And my adoptive parents, if you ever see them on television shows or hear them on interviews that they do, they'll make it very clear. The first time they laid eyes on me, they fell in love with me. And the first time they held me, they knew that I was going to be just fine. Because that was the power of faith in their lives. And so I grew up in this normal home, or so I thought, for so many years. And adoption was our normal. Our parents tried for about 15 years to conceive a biological child of their own. And just like there's no medical reason why I survive, there was really no medical reason why our parents couldn't conceive a child. That was God's plan. Because the plan was for them to adopt my older sister, who's adopted from another family, and then to adopt me. And after 15 years of trying, they finally had my little brother. <laughs> Tonight. My brother has some very funny stories to tell about me. God bless him, he is a funny guy. But that was our normal. That was our normal. We knew that we had been adopted. We knew that we were special and loved and wanted. And I will tell you, never once in my life in those 14 years could I have ever thought that my parents would have even considered aborting me. I simply thought, how courageous and loving and selfless of them that when they knew they couldn't care for me, that they made an adoption plan for me. Never once could I have considered what the real truth was in my life. And when I was 14, the unthinkable happened in our house. My older sister became pregnant as a high school student. 
And I was telling some of the teens yesterday, I call those the where the rubber hits the road moments. Where when you have a pro-life family, when you have a faith-filled family, suddenly it's when that very thing happens to you that you never thought would. That it really makes you think and really makes you put those beliefs into play. And what I didn't know at the time is that my sister was struggling. She was scared to death. Scared to tell our parents. Scared about how she was going to continue with her education. How she was going to be a single parent. But she was courageous and she told our parents about her pregnancy. And our parents did the unthinkable, I think, in their book. They sat her down and they told her about my survival. So that she would understand, truly understand to the depths of her soul, how precious and important every human life is. And being the great sister that my sister is, she tipped me off to the fact that there was more of the story. And if anybody's ever heard me share the story before, certainly my sister probably didn't mean for it to be something helpful to me at the time. <laughs> That's probably the kindest, gentlest way I can put that this morning. 14-year-old sister, 18-year-old sister, you know something's really going to go after her. Yeah. But what my sister didn't know is when she tipped me off to that fact, it was going to change all of our lives forever in the best of ways. And now it's changing the world. That night, after my sister tipped me off, I sat my mother down and I told her about the argument that my sister and I had and that she had told me to ask mom for the truth. And it was there that night that my mother had to sit me down and tell me that I hadn't just been adopted, that there had been a lethal attempt on my life, all in the name of someone else's choice. And I was devastated that night. Never in a million years could I have been prepared to know that my life was supposed to end. And as much as I had great joy knowing in that moment that God had a great plan for my life, I was also devastated beyond belief. As much as we know how much we are loved, there are things that happen in this world that break us down. And that was one of my moments. And I struggled for many, many years. I struggled with being embarrassed, ashamed, and even guilty. I felt so guilty knowing of how many other children have lost their lives to abortion. And I was the one who lived. And I felt for so many years, like, who am I to come forward and say anything? Who am I to come forward when I have this blessed life? I am perfectly healthy. I have a wonderful adoptive family. I have achieved so many beautiful things in my life through Christ. Who am I? I'm the one. I'm the one. The Lord knew long before I ever could recognize that this was the plan for my life. And this is the calling for me. And as you can hear in my voice, that is something that I am so overwhelmed by. To be a voice for 53 million other children. be who I am. And I don't have time today to share all of my story with you, but I will tell you that it amazes even me. <laughs> and not because I think so highly of myself, but because I think so highly of what God has done in my life. And I've had an opportunity over the last almost 20 years of my life to find my biological family. I even discovered I was living in the same city as my own biological father. I've had the opportunity to be united with members of my father's family. I've had an opportunity to reach out to my mother, my biological mother and her side of the family. And I ultimately gave birth to our Olivia at the very same hospital where my life was supposed to end. <laughs> yeah, feel free to say, whoa, I agree. <laughs> whoa, usually I try to prepare people for that. And that is a whoa. That is a woe. That is about how God redeems people's lives. And that's what I want not only people who are apathetic to abortion to understand, but men and women who are vulnerable to abortion. I want people to understand that no matter their circumstance, no matter what situation they're in,
God can redeem that situation. Amen. And God can redeem every single experience, every mistake that is made in someone's life. That's the beauty of the world that we live in. Amen. That's the beauty of the world that we live in. And certainly, as you were hearing in my bio, what I figured out in all of this is that none of it is about me. None of it is about me. It's about everyone who is impacted by abortion, including my own beautiful little girl. If you haven't had a chance to see her yet, you'll know it's her, because she'll be dancing down the hallway. <laughs> she wakes up singing and she goes to bed singing. And if she's not singing, she's talking. I'm not sure where she gets it from. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's her dad. But she is such a blessing, and I hope you have the opportunity to see her and, and talk with us while you're here. But what I figured out not long after Olivia was born is, is just that huge intergenerational impact of abortion. You know, no one can ever think when they're going in for that abortion what the long-reaching impact is going to be. You know, what we know, what people think is it's a sense of relief. It's going to make my problem go away. You know, that's what so many are sold in our society, that somehow it's, it's the child that's a problem, it's the pregnancy that's a problem, it's all of those other forces behind it that are the problem. We know that. We know that. But what people can't sometimes think about is that one abortion that took place 34 years ago, how many lives have been forever changed because of it? And if you visit my website, and you'll have a chance to meet me later, I have a, a booth outside, but you'll see a ripple effect of a water. And you'll see a quote that, that God just laid on my heart right after Libby was born. And that quote is that one decision, one single moment, can have such a detrimental impact on so many people, living and dead, born and yet to be conceived. That is the ripple effect of abortion in families and communities in our world. So many lives have been lost and so many lives have been forever changed. And certainly we know that apathy has a ripple effect. Apathy has a ripple effect on abortion in all of our lives. Every time a person remains indifferent to the underlying needs of an abortion-minded woman. Every time a person remains unconcerned about the reality of coercion when it comes to abortion, to the fact that research and women's own experiences point to the fact that most women really don't have a choice when it comes to abortion, each and every one of those times that someone is indifferent or unconcerned, a child's life is ended and a woman's life is forever transformed. And certainly every time a legislator fails to interest themselves in a piece of pro-life legislation that would protect the lives of their pre-born constituents and help support the lives of the men and women in their constituency, every single time someone in the church congregation <coughs> remains unconcerned about the person sitting next to them, and their future. Every time they remain unconcerned about what is happening in their life or bringing up the topic of abortion, period, every single one of those times a child's life is ended and a man and a woman's life are forever changed. And I'm living testament of that. My daughter is living testament of that. And certainly, I'm not going to let that get me down. I'm not going to let that apathy slow me down. I'm not going to let it silence me. What I am going to let it do is motivate me. I'm going to let the apathy that exists right now in our nation motivate me to continue to change people's hearts and minds. I'm going to let it motivate me to continue to educate people about abortion. And I know I'm in good company here today. And I just hope and pray that you continue to stand with me to take America back to continue to instill our beliefs and our values about the sanctity of every human life from conception to natural death across our nation. I appreciate your time and all of your efforts. Thank you.